So in three dimensions, there's <coughs> churn simons gauge theory. So I'm first going to say a couple words to, to indicate where we're going to head for tomorrow or perhaps at the end of today's lecture and what it has to do with geometric Langlands, why it's in this workshop. In three dimensions, there's churn simons gauge theory. But around the year 2000, Kovanov, who was a student of Igor Frankel and other methodists, discovered Kovanov homology which is trying to be a 3 plus 1 or 4 dimensional theory that's related to Chern-Simons in 3 dimensions. So Chern-Simons for a knot in 3 space gives a number but Kovanov gives a vector space in the same situation that ought to be the space of physical states of some 3 plus 1 dimensional theory. And not only did that happen, but there's a physical explanation by Gukov, Vafa and, by Gukov, Schwartz, and Vafa which I even believe is correct. But I always had trouble understanding it, so I wanted to find my own version that I could understand better. And my goal will be, sometime tomorrow, to explain my, my interpretation of what's the four-dimensional theory that's related to churn simons in three dimensions. And that'll also show what it has to do with geometric Langlands, because we're going to learn that the four-dimensional theory is basically the same topological field theory that's related to geometric Langlands, a twisted version of n equals 4 super Yang mills. But in order to understand it, we're going to have to take a new look at the path integral of quantum mechanics. Um, I did decide uh, I was going to have to compromise a little bit and not explain this quite as fully as I would like to. Uh, I'll explain enough of it to hopefully be self-contained and also to give what we will need for our application to churn simons theory. So we're going to start with the basic path integral. So we have, for example, a canonical momentum and a, a position, Q. Momenta and coordinates. And the most basic Feynman integral is an integral over time-dependent positions and coordinates. And usually there's also a Hamiltonian. <clears throat> now what one does with the Feynman integral, so we have what I'll call M, which is a classical phase space. Then we have functions on M. We want to somehow convert them into operators on a Hilbert space. So we want to construct what I'll call maybe R, which is a ring of observables. And it's supposed to act on a Hilbert space, curly H. And that's what we construct using the Feynman integral. So we have insertions of functions. So u1 up to uk will be functions on M. So we take u1 of u1 of t1 is an abbreviation for u1 evaluated at p of t1 and q of t1. We take functions on the manifold, we insert them at particular times, and then according to Feynman,
This gives a recipe for calculating matrix elements of quantum operators in a Hilbert space. Now, to simplify today's lecture, today we're going to take just traces. We could elaborate a little bit and construct quantum states and matrix elements between initial and final states, but we're going to take traces of a product of operators. <clears throat> so, to, to calculate a trace, Feynman would tell us that we do our path integral on a circle. So, P and Q are periodic functions of time. We do the path integral over what mathematicians would call the free loop space of our phase space, the space of maps from a circle to the phase space. And the integral over that free loop space of the right functions would be Feynman's recipe for constructing quantum mechanics. Well, here we would construct quantum mechanical traces. It takes some more work to explain how to calculate matrix elements between prescribed initial and final states. That's certainly important in quantum mechanics, but it will be easier for me to explain what I want to tell you if we just consider traces. Now, what are we going to do with the Feynman integral? What we're going to do with the Feynman integral, which is new, is to consider it as the analog of a contour integral, but in infinite dimensions. A finite dimensional prototype, a one dimensional prototype, let's say, would be an integral like this one. where f might be a polynomial in x. And if f is a polynomial in x, uh, first of all, the integral barely converges. It's oscillatory rather than truly convergent. In that respect, it is like the Feynman integral. Convergence depends upon the fact that there's, there are rapid oscillations at infinity. But I um, choose to think of this as an integral in the complex plane. In fact, so let's give an example of an, of an f. Here's an f, x to the fourth plus ax. So the original integral would be um, for real x, but we could analytically continue to a complex variable z, which is x plus iy. And then we'd say that our integral is over a contour in the complex z-plane. And then at this point, you might ask the question, well, what are the sensible contours for this integral? So the answer to that question has got to be that, uh, well, first of all, a closed contour would be an integral in which the integral would make sense on a closed contour, but it would be zero because the integrand is an entire function. So if, we, if gamma happens to be a closed contour, we won't get anywhere. The integral will simply be zero. Instead, we have to take an open contour that connects regions at infinity where the integral is well behaved. Well, what are the regions where the integral is well behaved? We want the real part of i z to the fourth plus a z to be much less than zero. Those are clearly the good regions for this integral. And if you think about it a little bit, there are four of them. <clears throat> there are four good regions in the complex plane. One in each quadrant. If we multiply z by i, we don't change its argument. So the picture is invariant under a pi over 2 rotation. And in each quadrant, there is a section where the real part is negative. So a good an example of a good integration contour would be a contour that begins in one region and ends in another. We might call this one gamma 1 and We could connect these two regions. That would give a second good contour, gamma 2. 
That's a third good contour, gamma 3. And here's a fourth good contour, gamma 4. So for this integral, just by hand, except that unfortunately it's hard to see because I wrote everything in one color, there were four good regions at infinity. And I could take any pair of adjacent good regions, write a contour connecting them. And that gives a contour in which the integral converges. They obey a relation that gamma 1 plus gamma 2 plus gamma 3 plus gamma 4 is 0. Because if you go all the way around, we could, since the integrand is an entire function, shrink the contour in the interior. So subject to this relation, there actually are three good contours. For this integral, and any sensible contour of integration is equivalent to a linear combination of these with some integer coefficients. For example, you could take the original integral on the real axis. Well, it was only barely good. The integral barely converged. You can improve it by displacing the integration contour slightly away from the real axis to make it more convergent. And when you do it, you'll find out that it's equivalent, uh, probably equivalent to this one. You displace the contour slightly above and then it will be equivalent to one of the contours I described. Okay. <clears throat> now, if there were more variables, we would have trouble doing this by hand, so we'd like a more systematic procedure. So I'm going to explain a more systematic procedure. So we let H be the real part of i z to the fourth plus a z in our example. So h is a real function. Yes? I just said, I just answered the question, but I didn't explain it very well. The original integral is barely convergent, but it is convergent. You can improve its convergence if you displace the contour away from the real axis slightly. And when you do that, you'll see that it's equivalent to some of these contours I've described. Um, Yes. Sorry. So the picture looks more like this. So let's try to draw a better picture. We've got good regions. So then we've got good contours. And the integral on the real axis is actually the sum of two of, the, of those good contours. In my paper on analytic trans continuation of trend Simons theory, I discussed in a lot of detail the Airy function, which comes from the case of a cubic exponent. Now, let's discuss this function h, which is the real part, the real, the expo the real part of the exponent that was causing the trouble. Um, the function h has a certain number of saddle points. It's got no local minima because it's the real part of a whole morphic function. And for the same reason, it has no local maxima. But it does have saddle points. In fact, the saddle points of h, which are technically called critical points or saddle points of h, are the same as the critical points by the Cauchy-Riemann equation, so the same as the critical points of our holomorphic function. So their solutions of f prime of z equals 0, where f prime of z is 4iz cubed plus a. It's a complex equation, so it has three critical points. And not coincidentally, 3 is also the number of good integration contours. The reason for that is simply that we can associate to every critical point a good integration contour. To do that, we pick a metric. Well, imagine you're a mountain climber. You start at a saddle point, and you want to go down. <clears throat> 
Well, you could go down on this side or on this side. And if we glue the two together, going up one way and down the other way, gives us an integration cycle. Cycle is a better word than contour because it's a multi-dimensional term. So I'm going to stop calling them contours and call them integration cycles. We get an integration cycle for each critical point. To describe better what we've done, we pick a metric which in our, my example could just be the obvious Kähler metric on the complex z-plane. And then we write the flow equation. I think I'll write this metric in real variables. That's dx1 squared plus dx2, dx squared plus dy squared, where z is x plus iy. We write then the flow equation, which is that dxi ds. I'm going to write s for the flow variable because we're interested in quantum mechanics, which already has time. So uh, the flow equation looks like so. It describes the motion of someone who flows away from the critical point at a rate given by the magnitude of the derivative. And you, you always flow in the direction where h is diminishing. So the flow equation will always produce an integration cycle on which h goes to minus infinity, unless somewhere along the flow you get stuck at another critical point. If h is the real part of a generic holomorphic function, it's not hard to prove that you never get stuck. So if you follow this procedure, you'll always flow in h to minus infinity, and you'll get an integration cycle on which the um, integral is well defined. Now, what I've been describing is basically the procedure of Morse theory, which attaches cycles to critical points. And for this kind of function, h is the real part of a generic holomorphic function. Morse theory shows that h is a perfect Morse function, which means that the correspondence between critical points and integration cycles is one-to-one. -one. Uh, I could explain that in more detail, but in planning what I was going to do, I decided I would, um, uh, couldn't go into too much detail here if we want to eventually get to Coven ophthalmology. I will stop for questions, though. Now, if we had been in n dimensions, the idea would basically be the same. Naively, we're interested in a real integral. But let's suppose that f can be analytically continued to a holomorphic function of complex variables. Then we want to find good integration cycles for this integral. Well, the trouble has to do with the real part of IF. And Moore's theory tells us what we just did in one dimension. We start with a critical point of h, and then we flow down. Flow down means that we solve the flow equations, dh ds, sorry, dx i ds is minus g i j dh dx j, where now the x's run over both the real and the imaginary parts of z. So there are twice as many x's as we started with. Maybe I should give them a more neutral name. I'll call them u's. There are two n u's, which are the real and imaginary parts of z. So the u's are x or y, where z i is x i plus i y i. So Morse theory will tell us that if the critical points are isolated, <coughs> 
you find a, um, a cycle which for our purposes is an integration cycle for the integral by starting at any critical point and flowing down. And in fact, if f is a sufficiently generic holomorphic function, you'll always get an integration cycle in this way. And they'll arise, they will all arise in precisely this fashion. Now, in a moment, we're going to be in a situation that isn't quite generic, meaning the critical points of H are not isolated. So I actually need to tell you what to do in a more general case, where instead of an ice, it's unfortunately hard to draw. We can, I think I had a better picture before, but we can draw a critical point in two dimensions, but it's hard to draw a critical point in many dimensions. I want you to imagine a case where H has a whole family of critical points. I'll call it N, which is a family of critical, this, it's a critical set of H. And we want to make an integration cycle. Well, if we simply pick a point on the family, so, okay, let's give names to things. So let's say that N is the dimension of our space M, and therefore it's the complex dimension of the complexification of M. I'll write M tilde for the complexification of M. So the dimension of an integration cycle is going to have to be n. The reason is that we're trying to integrate an n form. So we need to find a middle dimensional integration cycle. Now, in the case where the um, critical point set isn't isolated, which we're going to run into in a moment in quantum mechanics, <clears throat> let's say that n I'll call it n tilde because it's meant to be the critical point set of H inside the complexification. It'll be a complex manifold. So let's say its complex dimension is k. Then when we flow downward, we'll have n minus k directions for downward flow. The reason that happens is that um, we're assuming that H is flat in k complex dimensions. So it varies in n minus k complex dimensions. In each of those n minus k directions, it will look like a saddle point, one downward flow and one upward flow. So downward flow will give us an n minus k dimensional cycle, which is the wrong amount for an integration cycle. In our application to the Feynman integral, n will be infinite and k will be finite, so it will be a small mistake but we still will need to be able to correct the mistake. Well, Morse theory gives an answer for how to construct all integration cycles in this situation. And the answer is that you just pick any k-dimensional cycle c inside n tilde and flow from there. So I've drawn n tilde as a Riemann surface of complex dimension 1. So a middle dimensional cycle would be a real cycle, or in other words, a circle. So Morse theory would tell us to pick a circle on n, like the one I drew, which hopefully you can even see in the back. OK, we'll make a bigger one. You pick a circle, and you flow downward from that circle. And Morse theory will tell you that um, if H is generic, except for a requirement that it had this critical set, and you start with all possible cycles inside the critical set and flow down from there, you'll get all the reasonable integration cycles for your integral. Yes. Uh, I drew n tilde as if it were compact, but it, it won't be. In our applications, um, f would be, for example, polynomial on cn. Uh, 
So if it does have a critical set, which is a Riemann surface, it'll be a non-compact Riemann surface. Our integration cycles are allowed to be non-compact as long as the integral converges. But since when we flow off, when we flow downward, we go off forever. But h is going to minus infinity, which is good. But in the critical set, we're better off picking a compact cycle to make sure the integral will converge later on. So we're going to apply this machinery to the Feynman integral. We're just going to regard the Feynman integral as a, we're just going to analytically continue everything in the Feynman integral. Sorry. Yes? Is there a symmetry that guarantees Well, it's a fact of, uh, I'm cutting a lot of corners uh, to get to Kovanov homology later, but it's a fact of life about complex variables. Uh, so in complex dimension one, I made the remark that the real part of a holomorphic function does not have a local minimum or a maximum. Every critical point is a saddle point, meaning that the number of negative directions is one. The general case is similar. See, if it, near a critical point, a function is a constant, and then it's zero times linear functions, and then there's a, a matrix. Let's consider the case of a non-degenerate critical point so that that's an... Yes. But since I got this far, I'll finish for everybody else. There's a non-degenerate critical point set. Let's suppose that F has a non-degenerate critical point. There's a quadratic term, but we could pick coordinates to diagonalize it. Since we're over the complex numbers, we can always pick coordinates so it looks like this. And then when we analyze the upward and downward flow, it reduces to a bunch of decoupled one-dimensional problems. Whereas I explained, there's one direction for downward flow and one for upward flow because there's no local minimum or maximum of the real part of a holomorphic function. But explicitly, if z is x plus iy, then z squared is x squared minus y squared. So regardless of the sign, the real part is positive in one direction and negative in the other. So for an isolated critical point, downward flow will always give you a middle dimensional cycle. Middle dimensional is the right amount for integrating. We started with a real integral. So we were integrating a top form. Then we doubled the dimension in going to complex variables. So our integration form is middle dimensional. We always want a middle dimensional integration cycle. And that's what we get when we flow down from an isolated critical point. From a non-isolated critical point, the downward flow will give us the middle dimension in the directions perpendicular to the critical set. But we have to, by hand, pick a middle dimensional subspace of the critical set. There's no distinguished way to do that. We just pick our favorite one. So now we're going to apply this to um, the Feynman integral of quantum mechanics. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to do it in the case where the Hamiltonian is zero, meaning we're just trying to construct a Hilbert space and an algebra of, of observables. The problem of quantization isn't, it's not as well appreciated as it generally as it might be that the fundamental problem of quantum mechanics is to construct the Hilbert space and algebra of observables it has nothing to do with the choice of a Hamiltonian, which is an element of the algebra of observables. In my paper that will have the same title as this lecture, I do discuss a class of Hamiltonians which can be included in a particularly nice way. I'm not going to do it in the lecture because it won't help us get to Kovanov homology. So we're going to... I'll tell you after I explain what I'm going to do. Okay. So we'll consider uh, we'll be calculating, if you want, the trace of an arbitrary product of operators in the Hilbert space. So 
to not have questions of convergence, the Hilbert space should be finite dimensional, meaning the classical phase space should have had finite area. So it needs to be regularized if the Hilbert phase space has infinite air volume. And the, I mean, the most natural regularization is to pick initial and final states, which, however, is easiest to explain after I've told you how to compute traces. So we're going to discuss traces without worrying about whether the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. And we're going to do it, so we're going to ask the same question I discussed in finite dimensions. We take capital P and capital Q to be complex. So T is still real. So our path integral is an integral over complex valued functions of the time. But it should be taken over a middle dimensional cycle in the free loop space. Gamma should be a middle dimensional cycle in the space of maps of a circle to the complexification m hat of the phase space m. Remember, the hat tells us that we've complexified the phase space. I think I want to give you an example you might want to keep in mind. So, for example, I'll take M to be a two-sphere. So, uh, since, uh, since the case of a finite area phase space, finite volume phase space, is the case where there are no analytical difficulties, I'm going to give you an example with that property. So my phase space will be a sphere in R3. And then we're going to complexify it. And we complexify it by just taking the variables to be complex variables. So capital X's are complex variables, while the lowercase x's were real variables. So this is a complexified sphere in C3. This equation defines m hat. And then, see, it's inconvenient to literally introduce p's and q's in the case of a phase space that isn't simply R2n. It's better to describe the symplectic structure by giving a two-form that I'll call little f. The reason I'm calling it little f is that I'm going to reserve the name little omega, which is a common name for two form, symplectic forms, for something else that will appear later. So little f we could write as... Um, That's one formula. Another formula that's a little bit more useful sometimes is dx2 dx3 over x1. <clears throat> Sorry. There's something. Let's not worry about the two. Then uh, on the complexification, um, Okay, first let's describe the real case. So, in classical mechanics, what I've called F, you should think of as an abelian gauge, the curvature of an abelian gauge field in phase space. The Poisson brackets are defined by saying that the Poisson bracket of two functions where f with indices up, if you wish, is the inverse matrix to f with indices down. So this two-form defines the structure of classical mechanics by the Poisson brackets. But it's the... Um, curvature of an abelian gauge field. And what we've naively been writing as 
PI dQI is the same thing, uh, to write it in greater generality, it's AI dXI. In other words, without trying to split the coordinates into P's and Q's, which isn't going to work well globally, a better way to say it is that on the classical phase space, there's a symplectic form, which is a two-form F. It's the curvature of an abelian gauge field A. And the integrand of the Feynman integral is actually the holonomy around the circle of that abelian gauge field. So um, the complexification uh, is given by the same formula with capital letters instead of little letters. So now this is a complex value of two form. It's actually a holomorphic two form on the complex complexification of the phase space. I find it mildly more convenient in giving the lecture to put an I there. The reason is that otherwise the I in the original Feynman integral is going to be tagging along a lot. So this I and J are not equal to that I and J. I'm sorry about that. That's what you get with a blackboard talk, I'm afraid. <laughs> These are the same things, though. To say it as a mathematician would, F is a two-form on phase space, which we could write out in local coordinates, like so. That defines a matrix F, which is anti-symmetric and invertible. And we used its inverse over here. Now, we write exactly the same formula for the complexification. Except, once we go to complex variables, it's a nuisance to have the i in the exponent of the Feynman integral all the time. So I'm going to absorb it into omega. And then omega is d of a complex value at abelian gauge field lambda. And i times pi d, capital P i d q i just goes over to the holonomy of lambda. So our integral becomes That's the complexified Feynman integral, except that we're supposed to integrate over a middle dimensional cycle in the free loop space. <clears throat> now, our question is, what can we do that Feynman didn't do? Feynman integrated over the real cycle we're going to find another integration cycle in the free loop space of the complex manifold. And its only real claim to fame is that it will be chosen so that the integral converges. So if we pick a random gamma, the integral won't converge any more than it did in one dimension because the exponent the exponent is the exponential of a well, the exponent is a holomorphic function. Its real part isn't bounded above or below. So for a generic integration cycle, the integral wouldn't converge. The integration cycle has to be matched to the integral that we're trying to do. So we let h be the problem, which is the real part of the integral of lambda a dx a. And we want an integration cycle in which h is bounded above and goes to minus infinity. But I've told you how to do that by Morse theory in finite dimensions, and we will simply repeat the procedure for the Feynman integral. So we're going to, well, first of all, I'll let I'll let the u's be 
a set of variables that includes the real part of the x's and also the imaginary part of the x's. So the u's will be a system of local real coordinates. And we're going to let the... So in the path integral, the u's start out as functions of time. But we're going to promote them to functions of time and something else, which will be the flow direction in the flow equation of Morse theory. That's why I didn't use the name time for the flow equation. So we're going to promote them to two-dimensional fields. And we'll promote them, we'll ask that they obey an equation that'll be dui ds is minus the variational derivative of h, oh, sorry. So we have to pick G, which is a metric on loop space of M of the complex manifold. And du ds will be the gradient of the function H with respect to this metric. Now, we could pick any metric we want, but we would like to pick a nice metric that will make things simpler. And a nice metric is given by the following. Pick an ordinary metric that I'll call G on the complex manifold. We'll decide what G should be in a little while. For now, just take any Riemannian metric on the complex manifold. And then define a metric G on the loop space of the complex manifold by saying that delta U squared is the integral dt what I've done is to see if you have a variation of u which is a function of time time remember lives on a circle because we're taking traces I integrate over time a metric on loop space doesn't have to be made from this local and time formula, but if it isn't, the flow equations won't be differential equations. I want the flow equations to be partial differential equations in two dimensions. And if I do this, well, we do get partial differential equations in two dimensions. So you see, we have to calculate the variation of h. h was the integral of lambda a du a. So the variation of h will have to vary lambda with respect to u. So we'll get dA of lambda b minus db lambda a times the variation of u du. except that h was the real part, so here we still have the real part. The calculation I just did, well, I didn't quite do the calculation. It might look mildly unfamiliar, but all I did was to derive Hamilton's equations for the case where the Hamiltonian is zero. Hamilton's equations in general would say that du a ds times omega a b is the derivative of the Hamiltonian. But our Hamiltonian is zero. So Hamilton would say that omega times du ds is zero, except it's t. So in our, the time in our mechanical system was called t. And that, but since we had the real part of the Lagrangian, we would get the real part of the equation. So, um, I took PDQ and I varied it with respect to the P's and Q's. And the variation of PDQ is the variation of P times DQ I've done this computation. 
the real, if we write it in real variables, You've all presumably derived Hamilton's equations at some point, and this is just the special case without a Hamiltonian. So we get the real part of omega times du dt. And since the real part of omega will play an important role, I'll write omega, I'll give a name to the real part. I'll call the real part of omega little omega, while its imaginary part I'll call f. F was the name I used for the symplectic form on the original real phase space. The reason that F is the imaginary part rather than the real part is just that in defining capital omega, I included a factor of I to get rid of it from a lot of formulas. So F isn't exactly the real original real symplectic structure because we've extended from M where f was originally defined into m hat. f is an extension of the original real symplectic structure to the total space. And when we make that extension, f is the imaginary part of something whose real part we call little omega. <clears throat> so our equation becomes and since u depends now on two variables, I should write a partial derivative. Our equation has become du ds is minus i, curly i I'll call it, times du dt, where curly i is a matrix which is g inverse times omega. Now, something nice had better happen to justify making you listen to this lecture. So, to make so, something, see, what is I, curly i? Well, that depends on g, and I haven't told you anything about how to pick g. So, curly i is a very general thing at the moment. But we can always pick g so that curly i squared is minus 1. That's just linear algebra. Uh, omega is a non-degenerate anti-symmetric matrix. About G, we know nothing except that it's symmetric and positive definite. So for example, if we're in two dimensions and omega is this, we'd pick G to be this. See, in that example, omega squared was already minus 1, written in those coordinates. So if we take g to be 1, g inverse omega will square to minus 1. So in general, you, for a, some complex, a, in general, you can always pick real coordinates where omega looks like a direct sum of 2 by 2 blocks that look like this. And then in those coordinates, we take g to be 1. And that tells us how to make i square to minus 1. So if so, i is called an almost complex structure on the complex manifold. So M hat already was a complex manifold. But now we've given it an almost complex structure, curly I. Well, uh, so it might sound like too much of a good thing. And you might ask whether this almost complex structure could be the complex structure it already had, which we didn't give a name to. Well, the answer is that that's actually impossible. OK, I'll tell you why that's impossible in a moment. Let's just proceed with the fact that we've introduced an almost complex structure, curly I, and what it is we'll discuss, what it could be, we'll discuss later. When this is true, the equation, the flow equation, becomes invariant to conformal mappings. 
of what I call W, which is S plus IT. I hope you like that statement, because otherwise you won't like the lecture, I don't think. <laughs> so um, we can always, to, to, we picked a metric to define an integration cycle. Something which I should have emphasized is that by the n-dimensional version of Cauchy's theorem, if you change the integration cycle a little bit, you don't change the integral. So the metric didn't really matter, but we always could pick it so that i squared was minus 1. And then we get this extra symmetry that the equation is invariant under conformal mappings. See, if i squared is minus 1, we can pick coordinates so that i is a direct sum of blocks like this. And in such a block, our equation looks like dA dS is dB dT, dB dS is minus dA dT. And those are Cauchy Riemann equations. And as you know, the Cauchy Riemann equations are invariant under conformal mappings. Now, our equation here, if, the, if curly I is an integrable almost complex structure, it's literally a system of Cauchy Riemann equations if you pick the right coordinates. But it might not be possible to do that in general. But whether it is or isn't, when you verify the conformal invariance of the Cauchy Riemann equations, it doesn't matter if the almost complex structure is integrable. So we've always got invariance under conformal mappings. That's right. Now, OK, we need to discuss this more globally. And I realized I took a shortcut in the one-dimensional motivational case. So um, we started at a saddle point, and we flowed downward. And the integration cycle consists of all points we can flow down to. However, it takes an infinite amount of time to get anywhere when you flow away from a critical point. That's because if h is x squared minus y squared, then the flow equations would be dx ds equals minus x and dy ds equals y. So x would be a constant times e to the minus s, and y would be a constant times e to the s. So, if assuming that we, so you see, um, you never reach the critical points at a finite amount of time. S will always be infinity or minus infinity at a critical point. So, to flow to anywhere starting from the critical point takes a semi amount of time. We start at S equals minus infinity, and we flow to somewhere at, let's say, s equals 0. If we can flow here, we can always arrange that we arrive there at s equals 0, because we lingered for an infinite amount of time near the critical point. And by, starting, by changing this constant, we could always arrange so that we arrive at a prescribed place at s equals 0. So the definition of the integration cycle actually involves solving the flow equations on a semi-infinite interval where we start at the critical point, and we end anywhere. The integration cycle consists of all the places where we could have ended. So we have to implement that here. What we're flowing is a function that's defined on a circle, but we need to flow over a semi-infinite amount of s. So it's actually going to be a circle times an infinite cylinder. And the boundary conditions at s equals 0 is that we allow any u of t at s equals 0. The possible boundary values are exactly, they form the, precisely the integration cycle over which we wish to integrate. integrate. But here, we start at the critical point. The critical points are solutions of Hamilton's equations where the Hamiltonian is 0. 
But when the Hamiltonian is zero, Hamilton's equations tell you that the solution is independent of time. So u of t and s equals minus infinity is independent of time. Now, since the equation is invariant under conformal mappings, let's make a conformal mapping of the semi-infinite cylinder. We let z be the exponential of w. That maps the semi-infinite cylinder to a disk, where still we have any u on the boundary at z, absolute value of z equals 1. The boundary is now where the absolute value of z equals 1, and we say nothing about what u is there. But what happens at s equals to minus infinity? Well, that becomes the uh, center of the disk. Generically, if we have a function on the semi-infinite cylinder, we map it to the disk. It won't be continuous at the origin. But here, the fact that u is independent of time at s equals to minus infinity precisely says that it's a continuous function at the origin. So u of z is well-defined for z, absolute value of z equal to less than 1, even at z equals 0. The boundary condition that we started at a critical point precisely says that after the conformal mapping, z is well-defined. Now, the space of critical points isn't isolated because Hamiltonian, Hamilton's equations with uh, zero Hamiltonian says that the orbit is a constant, but it could be any constant in M. So the critical point is any point in M which sits inside its complex, uh, sorry, any point in the complexification of M which sits inside its free loop space. Among all possible loops, the critical points are the constant loops. So we're in a situation I mentioned to you before. Um, in the directions normal, to, there's a finite dimensional space of critical points. A Morse theory isn't going to tell us what to do about it, except that we on our own have to pick a middle dimensional cycle. So we're going to pick V inside M hat, which is a middle dimensional cycle. And we're going to ask that the critical point we start at is in V. Yes? It does. Uh, well, we automatically... Okay. I already imposed that part. So the boundary condition should say that we lie in the... Oh, sorry, did you ask for M? Well, first I stated it crudely that it was any point in M hat. But the, crudely, we, at a minimum, we start from a critical point. A critical point is any constant loop. But when the, in this case, the space of constant loops has a positive dimension. So Moore's theory says we should cut that down to a middle dimensional subspace. So we pick a middle dimensional subspace of M hat. And we start the flow from constant maps to V, the middle dimensional subspace. For example, well, there are many examples, but an example would be that V could be the original M. We started with a real phase space inside the complex phase space, and that's a middle dimensional subspace of the real subspace. So we could decide that we'd start on the original phase space. We don't have to, though. In general, we could start on any middle dimensional subspace of the real subspace, uh, of the complex subspace. So we've gotten a recipe for an integration cycle. The integration cycle consists of boundary values of solutions. OK, I think I should give this equation a name. This equation is called the, the equation for an I pseudo-holomorphic curve. Or a pseudo-holomorphic map. <coughs> 
So we're supposed to look at I pseudo-holomorphic maps of the disk, which map the origin to some given subspace, but otherwise they're completely arbitrary. The space of those I pseudo-holomorphic maps is then a middle dimensional cycle in the free loop space. It's actually, okay, those who are familiar with the work of Floor on Floor homology will recognize that this is the kind of middle dimensional cycle that Floor studied. The only novelty I'm introducing is regarded as an integration cycle for the Feynman integral. And that's only possible because we started with a complex symplectic manifold, whereas generically Floor considered a real symplectic manifold. Now, that this is probably a little bit abstract sounding, so I want to say a couple words about our example. We'll go back to our example where M was an ordinary sphere and then we complexified it to a complex sphere. So M hat is a complex manifold such that x1, x2, and x3 are holomorphic functions. Let's call that complex structure J, curly J. Now, you could ask, the, there's, there's a basic question, can we have I equals J? So, to get something nice out of the flow equations, we introduced an almost complex structure on the same manifold, and you could ask, is that the complex structure we started with? Well, the answer is no, because, see, omega was of type 2, 0 for J, since it was a holomorphic 2 form. So when we write omega, when we introduce its real part, you see little omega is of type 2, 0, plus 0, 2 for J. But omega is actually of type 1, 1 for I. Because... Um, The way I defined I as the metric inverse times omega, um, well, it allows omega to be of type 1, 1, but doesn't allow it to be of type 2, 0, plus 0, 2. So I and J can't be equal. The best thing for them to do is actually the opposite of being equal. The best, and there's no obstruction to picking this, is to take I to anti-commute with J rather than commuting as it would if they were equal. And then if we let curly K be IJ, you find that I, curly IJ and K obey the quaternion relations. So we've found an almost hyperkähler structure. Now, the simplest case of this will be when it actually is hyperkähler, and my example will work, because this complex manifold admits a hyperkähler metric called the aguchi hansen metric. So what we should do is to pick the metric in the flow equations to be the aguchi hansen metric. And then what I've called curly I is the usual I of the aguchi hansen manifold, and what I've called curly J is the usual J. So when there is a hyperkähler metric, we want to pick that one. But if there isn't a hyperkähler metric, we do everything else I've said with the almost hyperkähler structure. Almost hyperkähler structure means that curly I might not be integrable, although all the other usual relations are obeyed. Any questions? <laughs> In our example, we're trying to describe the spin angular momentum. So we've gotten a recipe, but it might look like a slightly weird recipe.
for an integration cycle for the Feynman integral. And now we're going to re-express that recipe in a standard form. Let's first write down the recipe, though. So we're integrating over functions ui of t and s, or maybe I'll call it ui of z, where the absolute value of z is equal to or less than 1. But we want a constraint that says that the equation for an i holomorphic curve is satisfied. That equation is that du ds uh, plus i du dt is 0. There's also a more minor constraint that um, a delta function that says that u of s equals minus infinity is in v. And then there's the function that we're trying to integrate. So we have our observables ui of ti, or I could call them ui of zi, where zi is evaluated e to the i ti. And then we had the original Feynman integrand. So I've written this in a hybrid fashion. I've written here the original Feynman integrand, the exponential of PDQ times the observables we're trying to evaluate. But we're integrating them over functions of u that we regard as functions of two variables, which we could combine to a complex variable z. But they're highly constrained. The main constraint, because it uh, is a differential constraint, is that they have to obey this system of elliptic differential equations in two dimensions, the equation for an i pseudo-holomorphic map. There's also a finite dimensional constraint about where the origin gets mapped. I'm going to now convert this into a standard path integral. And the way to do that is also standard. Wherever we have a delta function, we give it an exponential representation. So we're going to introduce another field, which I'll call t, which will enforce this big delta function constraint. The little delta function we'll worry about later, but the bit we want to deal with the big delta function. So we're going to write this as an integral now over two fields. This is, we're going to get there by successive approximations. So we deal with the big delta function I'm going to abbreviate the thing which is supposed to be 0 as curly du to try to keep formulas reasonably visible. The delta function saying that at the origin we map to v, I'll just call it delta v. And the observables I'll call ui evaluated at boundary point zi. So if we, the most obvious way to get a delta function that would make us live on the right place would be to um, introduce a Lagrange multiplier t that's defined on the disk and enforces the constraint that du should be 0. The notation du is a little misleading because it looks like a linear operator. d is actually a nonlinear function of u. The reason it is is that curly i isn't constant. It depends on u. Now, this integral is supported on the right cycle, but it's the wrong integral because it's the wrong function. The nature of the mistake is that um, when we integrate over t, we'll get a delta of du, d of u. We'll run into the following fact. If we have a delta function of f of x, that'll be something like f prime of a times delta of x minus a if f of a equals 0. Uh, 
So in this situation, we're going to get a determinant of the linearization of this operator, of this function d of u. And we don't want that determinant. The reason we don't want it, well, it'll be the wrong answer. It won't agree with the Feynman integral. But one specific thing that will go wrong is that if we literally consider this problem, the metric g that we use in defining the flow equations will matter. It's not supposed to matter. It was a way of finding an integration cycle for the Feynman integral. A slightly different g should give us a slightly different but equivalent integration cycle. So what's wrong is that when we do this, though, we're going to get 1 over a determinant of the linearization. I'll call the linear, I'll, call, I'll write d sub l for the linear operator that you get by linearizing the nonlinear function d. We don't want this determinant. Yes, I guess so. What this meant here was, geometrically, we have an integration cycle defined by this equation. This is a differential form of the right degree to be integrated on that cycle. We want to do that integral. You're correct in the criticism. What we've written differs from what I said by a determinant. Now, the way of uh, uh, canceling the determinant is standard. We add fermions which I'll call chi and psi. Let's not write it again and just instead add them. We take the kinetic energy operator for chi and psi to be the linear, the, precisely the linearized operator whose determinant we didn't want. So psi um, lies in the tangent space to u. So psi is the type of object on which the linearization of that nonlinear function can act. And chi is whatever has to be that's dual to where this linearized operator lands you. So in other words, chi and psi are what they've got to be, so the formula makes sense. Now, when we do this, our determinants cancel. And this actually is a representation of the Feynman integral over a different integration cycle in terms of two-dimensional fields. Now, it might look slightly unfamiliar, I must tell you. <laughs> so I'm going to manipulate it a little bit to make it more familiar. First of all, the integral I've just described has a fermionic symmetry. where delta u is psi, delta psi is 0, delta chi is t, and delta t is 0. So in particular, delta squared is 0. And this term here is delta of something. It's delta of chi times d of u. It's because it is delta of something that the details of the metric don't matter. If you were to differentiate this formula with respect to the metric we used in defining uh, the function, nonlinear function d of u, then um, the variation of the metric would only appear inside d of something and therefore wouldn't affect the integral, inside delta of something. Delta corresponds to what you might call the topological supersymmetry or the BRST operator. So we were trying to get a formula that only depended on the original quantum mechanics problem to find it on the boundary and not on the details of the metric we use to get an integration cycle. So that is ensured by the fact that delta squared is zero and the details all lie inside delta of something. Now, to make this look a little bit more standard, we can use the fact that we've that adding delta of something to the Lagrangian um, doesn't matter, so I'm going to add a little something, which will be at minus epsilon t squared, which happens to be delta of minus epsilon chi t. Delta t was zero and delta chi is t, so delta of chi t is t squared. 
we don't have to do this. I'm only doing it to help us get something we'll recognize. So now we do the path integral over t. So we get another representation. Now something nice happens, which is that d of u squared is the action, the bos usual bosonic action of a sigma model up to a boundary term. Remember that d of u was du ds plus curly i times du dt. So d of u squared integrated is the integral of du ds squared plus du dt squared plus a boundary term. So up to a boundary term, the bulk action is the standard action of a two-dimensional sigma model. Although it's disguised in the way we've arrived at it, the fermion action is also the fermion action of a conventional two-dimensional sigma model. The fermions are simply the A-twisted fermions of the A model with this target space. What we've arrived at, the two-dimensional A model with symplectic structure omega, and target m hat. The delta function delta v also has a nice interpretation in the A model. The closed string observables of the A model are precisely delta functions saying that at a given point the map must map you to a given subspace of the target space. So delta v is a standard A model observable. We can add the epsilon term because it was delta of something and delta squared was zero. Uh, but we could also be more concrete. Let's do it in one dimension. This gives a delta function. Well, okay. Just in terms of the value of an integral, that integral is independent of x because we could do the x integral first. <laughs> so <laughs> now here we've got more functions, more stuff that depends on x, but we've got the delta symmetry. So it boils down to this. Any other questions? Yes, but um, in A model language, you, you have to be a little careful. You have to keep track of boundary terms. So we only got the standard sigma model action up to a boundary term, which is important. If you want to know what the boundary term is, oh, sorry, I left out an important factor here, which is the exponential of lambda a dt dua. And then we get the exponential of some other boundary term, which depends on epsilon. Epsilon equals zero was the most natural value in my derivation. But epsilon equals one is the most natural value for comparing to physical sigma models. 
Because if epsilon is 1, the boundary term exactly cancels the bad part of this exponential. At epsilon equals 1, these two together combine to the exponential of the imaginary part of lambda a du a. And that's what Feynman had originally. That's the exponential of i times p dq. The real part which caused trouble is killed by this procedure of epsilon is 1. If you want to know how we killed it, we used it as a Morse function. <laughs> so since we used it as a, as a Morse function, we can relate its value to the way it changed under the flow. This bulk integral is how the Morse function changed under the flow. And so its boundary value, well, anyway. Okay, sorry. We have the nonlinear function d of u squared. Uh, I've tried to compress too much, so let me just write it over again. So I'm using the following fact. Exponential of d of u squared is the ex with a minus line. It's the exponential of minus the sigma model action. Okay. I'm telling you a fact that's important in the A model. There's a boundary correction to this formula, and the boundary correction is actually minus the thing that was causing trouble. I shouldn't have included this here. Sorry. We've got this formula. It's got a bulk term, which is d of u squared. It's got a boundary term, which was an unbounded exponential. Now we said epsilon equals 1. The bulk term is the standard action of a sigma model plus a boundary correction. The boundary correction happens to be minus the real part of the exponential. That didn't happen at random. That's part of the Morse theory story. I cut a lot of corners in getting here, so it might seem like an accident right now. So then we, uh, well, this thing is, of course, the exponential of lambda du. So we've canceled the real part, and what we're left over with is the imaginary part. What did you ask? We have an integral that's independent of epsilon. At epsilon equals 0, the localization on our new integration cycle is most obvious. At epsilon equals 1, we're about to make contact with the work of Kapustin and Orlov. So the boundary term that we originally had is equal to that, only when epsilon equals Yes, otherwise it's multiplied by 1 over epsilon. There's a formula for any epsilon. but. If you want to cancel what we already had, you have to set epsilon equals to 1. Now, in physical sigma models, what are you supposed to have? You're supposed to have a bulk term of a standard form with an imaginary boundary correction. The bosonic part of the boundary correction is supposed to be imaginary. So when we set epsilon equals 1, we get a physically sensible sigma model. I haven't fully explained why the fermion part is physically sensible, but it is. We get a a physically sensible sigma model with a normal bosonic action compatible with unitarity and an imaginary boundary correction which is also compatible with unitarity. It's the coupling to a chan paton bundle with a real curvature. Until we canceled the bad part of the exponent, the chan paton bundle had a complex curvature. But now we've landed in the physically sensible unitary world. So what we have, the boundary has got to be, it's an A-brain, but it's an A-brain whose target, whose support is all of the space. The traditional A-brains are Lagrangian A-brains with middle dimensional support, but we found an A-brain whose support is all of the space because we've put no constraint on the boundary values. So the brain we've rediscovered is actually the co-isotropic brain that was introduced by Kapustin and Orlov about six years ago. So all authors who have worked on it, including Kapustin and Orlov, Gualtieri, Gukov and me, and um, I'm going to have to apologize now for forgetting some of you. But all authors who have worked on co-isotropic brains have seen that they were somehow related to quantum mechanics. But I've given you what I think is a more direct explanation. We started with the Feynman integral of ordinary quantum mechanics, 
we asked an innocent question, at least I hope it sounded innocent, which was to find another integration cycle for the same integral. And we've arrived at an answer, which is that the A model path integral on the disk for the complexification, we have a conventional closed string vertex operator at the center and the coisotropic brain on the boundary. That path integral is a different integration cycle for the same, for the original Feynman integral. That's our punchline for today, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>well, we assumed it had a complexification. Yes. So, um, but you see, if you just say that something has a complexification, that's too vague a question. Because, for example, suppose it has a complexification. Then you could throw away at random a closed set that doesn't integrate the real locus, intersect the real locus. So the notion of a complexification is too flabby. We needed a complexification that in some sense was complete. But I couldn't tell you what complete meant until the end of the lecture. Now that we've arrived at the end, I can tell you what we needed at the beginning. What we need is a complexification that's complete in the sense that if you take the whole morphic two-form that continues the original real two-form and take its, well, in the lecture I took the original one to be the imaginary part, so then we take its real part. That has to have a good A model. There isn't any standard notion of completion for symplectic manifolds. So, you see, uh, I'm telling you what completeness means here. So that, I mean, I'm telling you what, it, well, this is more like a goal to understand that better. But, um, well, as we learn at the end, what we needed at the beginning was a complexification where the, the A model of omega is good. That's the right notion of completeness. Uh, so, you, you, uh, yeah, well, no, you always would introduce 1S. So suppose you, uh, we had quantum mechanics that depended on time. So we introduced, to get an integration cycle, a new variable that in our example promoted us from one to two dimensions. But to give you a very brief preview of tomorrow's lecture, we're going to start with chern simons theory in three dimensions. Then we're going to find a new integration cycle for the path integral by introducing a fourth variable. Something nice will happen, just as it did today, which is that the integral we'll get in four dimensions will be one we know about. It'll be the path integral of n equals four super young mills. And therefore, we're going to be able to use S-duality in all the standard tricks. Yes? So you write it as capital for physical people. Does that mean that from a point of view, all of these non-trivial finite contours are also physically sensible that they need to posit that in other spaces? Yes, except, you see, today I only explained how to compute a trace. But Gukov and I wrote a paper where we used the same machinery of the A model to describe the quantum Hilbert space in the context of the A model. If you want a more complete answer than I can give now, I'd better refer you to our paper. Um, the facts I've arrived at at the end of my lecture are mostly not new, but they've seemed rather mysterious. Yes. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> you're setting a very high bar. So the answer to that's going to be no, um, in general. In other words, you'll, you can, what will tend to happen, okay. Gukov and I explained what is needed in the setup to get a physical Hilbert space, and it's not going to work in a random example. It can happen, though, that it works in more than one way. For example, in the example we started with, in the only example I gave in the lecture, uh, if you take the x's to be real, that's a good case. But another good case is that x1 is real and positive, and x2 and x3 are imaginary. Kukov and I actually discussed both of these cases in relation to this example. So 
Well, that's an example where you get two different Hilbert spaces in relation to the same problem. A fact that mathematicians working in representation theory know very well by hand in this example. I was always unsatisfied to hear it described by hand. So I consider this approach more satisfactory, but I doubt most people working in representation theory will. Yes? Yes. Well, I can't promise it won't work, but it certainly won't work from this point of view. So you started out with the question of computing trace over the yes. right. the quantization of the right. quantum kind of right. one's common kind of Right. And then what you got essentially is a trace of those operators on the space of strings between two operators, right? And it wasn't. So that was that's it, an interpretation. Um, it's not really the trace. Uh, well, OK. If you wanted the trace in the sigma model, you would have been on a cylinder. To, for a path integral to have an interpretation as a trace, the space in which you're doing the path integral needs a map to a circle. The disk lack, lacks such a map. So you see, we computed an analytic continuation. This is a partial answer to one of the questions. We computed an analytic continuation of a path integral that has the interpretation of a trace. But the analytic continuation we arrived at, it will obey all the word identities that traces obey. It'll, rep it'll have all the algebraic properties as if it's a trace, but it won't necessarily be a trace. It isn't, is that to interpret a path integral as a trace, you need to be able to map the space to a circle. Here we're on a disk, which doesn't map to a circle. But with all of you identified the Hilbert space with some. We were on a cylinder. With Gukov, and, uh, Gukov, you see, in today's lecture, we flowed from s equals minus infinity to a finite time. With Gukov, we flowed over, in this language, we didn't use the language of flow equations, but we flowed over a finite length of time. So we were on a cylinder. And then on a cylinder, you will have an interpretation of a trace. So in that case, you would have a home between two brain and brain. Yes, right? right. But here, you get a number. So can that number be interpreted as something that has to do with that vector space? Well, there isn't a vector space. There's only an algebra. You see, what we computed here, something that has all the algebraic properties of a trace, but may not be a trace is equivalent to having a deformation of the algebra of observables without a space that it acts on other than itself. So what we have arrived at, what, what we've arrived at is more what would be called deformation quantization rather than quantization. So the algebra of j holomorphic functions, in our example, the polynomials and the x's, so if we actually calculated traces in this example, we'd find that, that they were not equal. They depended on the operator ordering. This was essentially originally explained by Kapustin in a different paper. Well, I've by now given several explanations in different papers. So we get, one gets a non-commutative deformation of the algebra of holomorphic functions. You don't really find something at axon. To find something at axon, you need a second brain. But here you do have two brains, right? Because you have this quasi-trophic brain and also V is a Well, we didn't, I didn't, V was middle dimensional, but we didn't ask that it should be Lagrangian. If we decide to ask V to be Lagrangian, then you're right. But to get something that naturally, still the path integral on the disk would be the wrong thing. We should consider a path integral in a circle with the co-isotropic brain on this side and the Lagrangian brain on the other side. So in that case, you would actually get a trace. Then we would get an honest trace. We get an honest trace in a vector space, and Gukov and I explained when that vector space has a Hermitian form. The whole flow is called a pseudo-holomorphic map. The whole flow 
just terminology, but mathematicians refer to a flow that obeys this equation as a pseudo-holomorphic map. The critical point itself in this context was just a constant point, was just a point in the target. So it doesn't have such a fancy name. It's localized on the pseudo-holomorphic map. You see, in the A model, one is accustomed to localizing on pseudo-holomorphic maps. Usually one meets finite dimensional spaces of pseudo-holomorphic maps. The only thing I'm telling you which is new from the general A model, the question, Kapustin and Orlov described this brain, but in the subsequent literature, what pseudo-holomorphic maps it localizes on hasn't been carefully explained. The answer is it localizes on all of them, the whole infinite dimensional space of pseudo-holomorphic maps. If you want, the path integral on a disk with the with the quasi-tropic brain on the boundary localizes on quantum mechanics. <laughs> quantum mechanics is the infinite dimensional path integral we started with. <laughs>